But you take your Bibles and turn with me to John, Gospel of John, chapter 12. We're looking at verse 12 through 19. Gospel of John, chapter 12. Gospel of John, chapter 12, we'll be looking at verse 12 through 19. The triumphal entry of Christ to Jerusalem. Reading from the Holman Christian Standard Bible, if you have another version, please follow along as I read. John, chapter 12, beginning in verse 12. The next day, when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one, the king of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, just as is written, fear no more, daughter Zion, look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things had been written about which he had been with and had done these things to him. Verse 17, Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard that he had done this sign. Then the Pharisees said to one another, You see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. The reading of God's word. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, as we think about these words from the Apostle John, we're reminded of very familiar words to us, the triumphal entry of Christ to Jerusalem. Words, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, help us to see these words afresh. But help us to be mindful, Lord, of what you do in our lives. The busyness of life. The stresses, the anxieties, the sadness, the hurt. The shame, the questions, the doubt. Lord, I pray that your spirit would meet us where we are and draw us closer to you from these words. In your name that I pray, amen. I'm going to talk about for a minute of the different personalities that you might find in the workplace. You know, perhaps some point in your working career, you have stopped and asked yourself, who do I really work with on the job day to day? What makes them tick? Why do they do the things that they do? Or why do they not do the things that others think they should do? Well, according to Indeed.com, there are four types of coworkers you might find in the workplace, four different personalities. Uh, the first of these coworkers is the logical person. We'll call him Logical Larry. Logical Larry is driven. Larry's a doer. He can analyze a problem and he can tackle it head on. He is data oriented. He loves a good challenge. Logical Larry is focused on getting his goals done. But, sadly, Larry's amount of focus often causes him to forget to communicate to others, maybe even steamroll someone in their actions. Larry doesn't work great with others. But Larry is also all about the logic. Then there's detail-oriented Dwight. 
He's learner-driven, extremely detailed, oriented to a T. Dwight brings a sense of order and stability. He's extremely pragmatic. He avoids risk and is slow in his approach to work and different things. He's very thoughtful. He considers the means. He considers the outcome, sometimes to his fault. He can struggle to execute uh, such a meticulous plan, and sometimes he lacks action. But Dwight is all about the details in the workplace. Larry, Dwight, then there's Susan in the workplace. Susan is very supportive. She's emotionally driven. She's also very passionate, expressive, very supportive to other coworkers. Did I say supportive? She builds <coughs> the team together so they can work in harmony. She is sensitive to the feelings of everyone around her. She helps others to be successful, helps others to communicate to one another, understands the context of their situation. Sometimes, though, Susan is too supportive when someone needs discipline or correction. But Susan is all about supporting others. With Larry, Dwight, Susan. And lastly, there's Ida. Ida has her ideas. Ida is an idea-oriented person, much like a pioneer, a leader, a big-picture thinker. Ida has vision and is inspiring to others <coughs> and helps believe in the vision. She thrives on endless risks and possibilities and uh, finds energy in them. Ida is great at uh, turning obstacles into opportunities. But at the end of the day, these risks, these opportunities could all unravel in the details if the details don't line up. Ida is all about the ideas and great possibilities. Now, these are some of the people you might experience in the workplace, and some maybe have similar traits in others. Sadly, though, if you work by yourself, as some of you do, you might have to carry on all these personalities, like have a split personality from time to time. But that's beside the point. But now that we have a better understanding of, of different people in the workplace you might, uh, you might work with, uh, at the end of the day, uh, or strive to be the person who you're designed to be. Who did God make you to be in the workplace? So take all those personalities. We're going to forget about them for a minute as we think about the narrative in John. But John also describes a few different people around Jesus. <coughs> and perhaps we might see some similarities in people around the thought of Jesus today. So as is custom this time of year, we're looking at the events surrounding the first Easter, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last week, we asked a simple question, why the cross? Why did Jesus have to die on the cross? You know, the Jews could have stoned him like they did in Acts 7 uh, with Stephen. They tried to do it with Jesus in John 10. And nobody in those contexts ever mentioned Pilate <coughs> before they killed Stephen. Actually, Leviticus 26, 16 says if someone blasphemes God, the Jews could take that person out and stone him under the Mosaic law. But lo and behold, it was the type of death that the Jews desired of Jesus, the crucifix, the, uh, uh, the cross. And Jesus even refers to this in John 12, verse 32, when he says, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw people to myself. And we have a clerical note in verse 33, explanatory note, uh, where John tells us that this describes what type of death he was going to die. So Jesus had a sense of what type of death he was going to die, and the Jews knew what type of death they wanted for Jesus. On the cross was the death of a criminal. They wanted the death of a criminal on a cross. 
But the second element we mentioned from John in answering the question, why the cross, from John 18, is according to John, Jesus seemingly died for the wrong reason. Seemingly died for the wrong reason. Pilate asked Jesus <coughs> if he's the king of the Jews, and we remember Jesus' response is that he is a king from a different kingdom, not of this world, and Jesus says that he was made for this. We are told Jesus is crucified with a sign in chapter 19 that says, Jesus the Nazarene, the king of the Jews. In other words, he in John's gospel claims to be a king, not directly from the Jews in this narrative, but instead a kingdom not of this world, a king of heaven, the king who came to die the death of a criminal on a cross. Why? Why would King Jesus do that? Well, that's where we turn to Galatians 3 and the Apostle Paul, who, borrowing the words of Deuteronomy 21, 22 through 23, describes the fact that someone who dies on a tree is under the divine curse of God, divine punishment of God. Paul says in Galatians 3.13 that Christ became a curse for us and that everyone is cursed who hangs on a tree. Again, he's quoting uh, from the law here in Deuteronomy 21.22-23. through 23. And Paul then makes the connection that Jesus, who hung on a tree or a cross, became the curse of the law. Why? Why did Jesus become the curse of the law? Paul tells us so that we could be redeemed. That we could be redeemed. We could be forgiven by God. Bought back. So that by the way of the cross, we could join Christ in His kingdom. Because the very King of heaven came down died a terrible death on the cross as a criminal, so that we who are criminals before God, who have wronged Him for all of eternity, could at some point trust in His sacrifice and be bought back with the blood of Christ. Enter into His kingdom when we put our faith and trust in Him. You want something to rejoice over this Easter? It's not gas prices. It's not grocery prices. It's not even a Dollar General coming to a street near you. But it's God's grace in Jesus, a heavenly king, dying in our place so that we can join him in his kingdom someday. God's grace. Grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace that is greater than all our sin. So we're jumping into the book of John, relation to Holy Week. The week between the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus. One week from today, we'll be celebrating Easter, the resurrection. Historically, we can join with billions of Christians throughout history who have celebrated today, Palm Sunday. <clears throat> the historic nature, vivid description of Jesus riding on a donkey up to Jerusalem, fulfilling the words of Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So we're not going to dwell on this, but we are engaging chapter 12 of John. Chapter 12 starts off a new section in the book of John. You can divide the Gospel of John into basically two parts, two books, and many of you are familiar with these terms. The first 11 chapters is called the book of signs. And chapter 12 through 21 are called the book of glory. So the first 11 chapters, the book of signs describes seven signs that Jesus does or miracles. John calls them signs. 
uh, done by Jesus that point to his deity. A specific phrase throughout this section, uh, though in the first 11 chapters, is when Jesus uses the phrase, my hour, in connection with my hour has not yet come. We see this in chapter 2, verse 4, 7, verse 30, 8, verse 20, where Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. You know, when your wife is getting close to her due date, that she's going to have a baby, she may feel some abnormal pain. And the husband's first question, you know, that he's going to ask a hundred times is, is it time? Is it time to go to the hospital? And the answer is usually, no, it's not yet time. But typically the last time that husband asked the question, is it time? The answer is, yes, it's time. Let's go to the hospital. Notice that Jesus says in chapter 12, verse 23, it's no longer, the hour has not yet come. But chapter 12, verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. The book of glory. Now the theme of glory comes up often in John, this theme of glory. In the double sense of the term, Jesus believes that he'll be glorified through the hour on uh, through uh, through the hour, the time on the cross, though he says in his death in 12, verse 27, now my soul is troubled. What should I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But that is why I came to this hour. And John 17 further describes Jesus as he's seeking to glorify the Father on earth. As he desires to be glorified, though, in what he's about to endure what the Father has called him to do. So in chapter 12 and on, we are in the book of glory. Jesus believes that he will be glorified through the death, the rejoining of the Father. And we start off in chapter 12 with the anointing of Jesus at Bethany. And we're very familiar with this uh, passage uh, where he meets with the Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. Lazarus, he just recently raised from the dead, as recorded in chapter 11, uh, the last miracle that Jesus does. And here we see Mary uh, take an extremely generous amount of fragrant oil and she pours it on Jesus, pure and expensive nard, perhaps a year's worth of pay uh, for this nard that she puts on Jesus, the amount. And, you know, think about Jesus would have a very distinct smell after that. They'll probably carry on for a number of days uh, that she had put this uh, nard on Jesus. But then we get down to uh, when she's critiqued because this, Jesus says in verse, 11, verse 7, Jesus tells those who are saying, why would, you know, why would Mary do this? And he says, leave her alone. She has kept it for the day of my burial. So Jesus knows what is about to happen. And then we're told after this, a large crowd gathered there because they wanted to see Lazarus, who Jesus was raised from the dead. We'll come back to this point, but look with me. These very familiar words in this passage, what happens in verses 12 and 13 again of John chapter 12. This is again the beginning of the triumphal entry. Verse 12, the next day when the large crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, they took palm branches and went out to meet him. They kept shouting, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is the blessed one. Now, it's a phrase that's repeated a number of times here. Uh, and it's the phrase, the large crowd, the large crowd. See it in verse 9, where a large crowd of Jews learned that he was there. Uh, verse 12, a large crowd had come to the festival. And then in verse 17, where it just describes the crowd. Jesus is gathering a large crowd wherever he goes at this time. And the mood will change of this crowd quite soon. But I want to draw attention to the people mentioned here in verse 12. The large crowd at the festival, at the feast. It's a large crowd of people who have come up to Jerusalem for the festival, for the feast of the Passover. And we're told in verse 12 that when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, which is only about two miles from Bethany to Jerusalem, when they heard that he was coming, what did they do? They were already at Jerusalem. 
they heard and they went out or went down to meet him. In other words, they left the main event, which is what they were there for in Jerusalem. They left the event when they heard that Jesus was coming and they turned around and went back, went down to meet Jesus. They took palm branches. They went out to meet him. And what did they say? They said, Hosanna, he who comes in the name of the Lord is a blessed one. Now, I don't have to tell you that Hosanna is an expression that basically means help or I pray or save, I pray. Uh, it was a strictly lit uh, liturgical formula of praise according to the Net Bible notes. And these uh, words are coming out of Psalm 118, 25 through 26 in their proclamation. And they heard about this Jesus and the response is to praise him by shouting, Hosanna, save me or save, I pray. Blessed is the king of Israel who comes in the name of the Lord. Notice what they are shouting. They heard that Jesus was coming and they left Jerusalem and came down to Jesus to prepare the way with palm branches. Now, we can't prove this, but how many of these people at this grand entry, the triumphal entry of Jesus, sang a very different tune by Friday? And it was no longer Hosanna. Blessed is the king of Israel who comes in the name of the Lord. But perhaps they were shouting something else. Perhaps their opinion changed. Perhaps something happened that they didn't like or Jesus didn't do something they expected him to do. Speculation. But notice what happens next in verses 14 through 16. We're told the familiar words. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it just as is written. Fear no more, daughter Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. Verse 16, disciples did not understand these things at first. However, when Jesus was glorified, when they remembered these things, had written about him, and that these things, and that they had done these things to him, the king of Israel. Now, again, we can turn to the other gospels here, find out where did the donkey, where did the colt come from. Uh, but that's not as important to John uh, as what this verse symbolizes, which is the fulfillment, again, of the words of Zechariah 9.9, where Zechariah says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout in triumph, daughter Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So while the disciples didn't understand this quite in the moment, notice it says they remembered these things after Jesus was glorified, after he was glorified, and after they had done these things to him. <clears throat> Isn't it like the disciples to always miss the moment, you know, miss out on, on the moment, and, you know, instead for them, they, they, they go through the moment, not, you know, unsure of what's going on, and then afterwards, they remember, oh, yeah, you know, remember when Jesus said this or, you know, did that, you know, <clears throat> what was he, what was he saying in that he fulfilled, you know, here he fulfilling the words of Zechariah or Malachi or Isaiah. They always seem to miss the moment. And sometimes we do that when we follow Jesus. Sometimes we do it when we follow our parents. You know, your dad says when you're younger, you know, you can take the car out tonight, but remember, first put gas in it. And you say, yeah, dad, whatever, you know, and then you forget about it. And you're driving along, you end up on the side of the road with your friends in the dark. And you think, boy, I should have listened to dad and put gas in the car before we went and ran out of gas. You know, we might be reading scripture and think, you know, when will I ever need this verse? You know, whether you're hearing the daily bread or you're throughout your daily reading, you come across something that sticks with you and say, ah, I won't need to hear that. And then as you're going through life, you're like, boy, you know, that word keeps coming back to me. Bless those who curse me. Pray for those who mistreat me. Lord, the Spirit brings it back to us. Much like the disciples who missed out on the moment, they remembered what they were taught. They remembered what they had seen or the connection Jesus was making. So already we have two responses here from the people. We have the response of the large crowd. They heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. They turned around because uh, they were already in Jerusalem. They dropped what they were doing. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
blessed is the king of Israel. So we had the crowd that heard. Then we had the disciples who just followed. <coughs> they didn't quite realize what was happening in the moment. They were along for the ride, realizing later what was happening, what they saw, the statements being made. And when the dust settles, they saw a glorified Jesus. And they're left to essentially put the pieces together. So two groups around Jesus I wanted to point out here. These two groups, those who heard and those who seemingly just followed. But look at the next couple of groups in verses 17 through 19. <clears throat> 17 says, Meanwhile, the crowd which had been with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, notice what they did, continued to testify. This is also why the crowd met him, because they heard he had done this sign. When the Pharisees, then the Pharisees said to one another, you see, you've accomplished nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. So we're, here we have the word crowd again. But in some sense, this is a different crowd. The word crowd that was used in verse 12. The first crowd was those who were in Jerusalem. They heard that Jesus was coming. They went out to meet him. The first crowd was almost like ahead of Jesus. They were already in Jerusalem. They turned around and came back. But this crowd of people were almost behind Jesus. They met Jesus at the house of Mary and Martha. They wanted to see Lazarus, who we raised from the dead, who Jesus raised when they wanted to meet this man. You know, perhaps some of them uh, saw uh, Jesus uh, bring Lazarus back to life. They saw it with their own eyes. They took their friends and said, hey, you have to meet this guy named Lazarus. Oh yeah, and Jesus too. But you got to meet this guy. He rose from the dead. You know, see the sign, see this miracle that Jesus did. And what was the crowd doing according to verse 17? This crowd who saw Lazarus, the NIV says they continued to spread the word. Other versions said they bear record, bear witness they continued to testify. This word testify or bear witness is important to the Gospel of John. It's not, it's not as often used as the term believe or believer or believing, but giving testimony in Jesus is what we see. John 1, 7, talking about John the Baptist, he came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. It's used often of the uh, of John the Baptist's testimony to the nature of Jesus. Jesus even uses about his own nature. And what are these people doing here? They're testifying, bearing witness to others what they have experienced. They came and saw. So, so far now we have three groups of people. Those who heard in Jerusalem, they stopped their festivities, grabbed the palm branches, came out to Jesus, shouted Hosanna. We have disciples who are just kind of clueless in the moment. They're following Jesus all along. They remembered these things after, made the connections later on. And then we had this crowd seemingly behind Jesus, kind of catching up with him. What are they doing? They're testifying all these things. What they had seen with their own eyes, what Jesus did. He raised someone from the dead. And then there's a last group here. The last group in verse 17. The last group responding to Jesus is the Pharisees. And what do they say to one another? They say, you see, you've accomplished nothing. And notice what they say. Look, the world has gone after him, gone after Jesus. While this verse is encouraging to us, in the sense that how many people were taken after Jesus, it's it's also detrimental in a sense. Earlier in the chapter, the chief priests had decided that they were going to kill Lazarus because Jesus had brought him back from the dead. Imagine what Lazarus is thinking when he hears that. You know, not again. Why is this happening to me? <clears throat> you know, we're told at the end of chapter 11 that the high priests and the Pharisees had given orders in regards to Jesus, that if anyone knew where Jesus was, that they would report him so they could arrest him because we know they were plotting to kill him. Yet, how is that working out for them? How is it working out for the Pharisees? I would say not good. 
Very not good. <laughs> Instead, he's becoming popular. The opposite reaction is happening. The opposite is happening to what they were hoping for. They wanted to get rid of Jesus, quench his popularity because of his teaching, his purpose. Uh, and, and yet the whole world had now run to him. Now, while we could say more about this, I think we would stop here and think about these four types of people responding to the triumphal entry of Christ. Four different responses to Jesus and perhaps make a connection today. We have the first crowd, those in Jerusalem. They were the hearers. They're like the Henrys. They heard about Jesus, stopped what they were doing to go praise Jesus in the moment. Now, some might argue that in a few short days, their tune was not so much Hosanna, but instead they shouted, crucify him, crucify him. Why? Because perhaps these hearers, this Jesus didn't live up to their expectations. You read this quote in the few verses around Psalm 18, you wonder what they were expecting in Jesus. Verse 7 comes to mind of Psalm 118. The Lord is my helper, therefore I will look in triumph on those who hate me. Verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. These are shouts of joy and victory in the tents of Jerusalem. The Lord's hand, <coughs> right hand performs valiantly. The Lord's hand, right hand is raised. The Lord's hand performs valiantly. There is triumph in the blessed one. Perhaps their expectations for this deliverer, these, this Hosanna, was short-lived. The crowd, these Henrys, were hearers. No longer shouted Hosanna, but perhaps the death of their blessed one turned to crucify him. Crucify him. Then the second group that we read about is the disciples. They will call them Darius the distraught. In the moment they obey and they're not quite sure what to do. They, yet they follow and they put these pieces together later after Jesus is glorified. They're like a mother who sets out to clean the house early in the morning after her husband goes to work and she has everything picked up the floor and then the kids wake up and chaos ensues like warriors fighting a great battle. They get out all the toys, all the art supplies. The kids play hard and vanquish their foe, win the great battle, create a big mess. And when the storm calms and the kids fall asleep, the mother starts to pick up the pieces of their siege, lick her battle wounds, and then takes a deep breath, knowing that they are learning valuable lessons, developing whether their kids realize it or not. The disciples, like those kids, will come back and say thank you. Thank you for caring for us, even though we didn't realize what was happening in the moment. We have Henry, the hearers of the crowd. And we have Darius, the disciple of Jesus. But we also have Sam, the seeker of signs. Sam is part of the crowd who's behind Jesus who saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Perhaps he saw other signs and miracles that Jesus did. Sam is so supportive of Jesus, he testifies to others what he has seen. He saw Jesus raise someone from the dead. He's telling everyone he knows, hey, have you heard of this Jesus guy? He is incredible. He's headed to Jerusalem. <clears throat> Let's go see what he's going to do next. Sadly, though, there's a verse in John that speaks of the fate or the faith of people like Sam. And that's in chapter 12, verse 27, which says this. Even though he had performed so many signs in their presence, they did not believe in him. Even though Sam wore a shirt that said, Jesus' biggest fan. He's still just a fan, not a true follower. Sam is a seeker of Jesus. 
He's drawn to the signs, the miracles, and yet at the end of the day, that's as far as Sam goes. Last but not least is Phil the Pharisee. The religious uh, rulers that realize the transaction that Jesus, uh, the traction that Jesus is receiving, they are envious, but they're also out for blood. They had the people's interest in mind, of course, the Mosaic law on their side, their tradition, even their own advanced rules and regulations over God's laws, their self-righteousness as their uh, hatred towards Jesus grows more and more. Phil the Pharisee would rather see the death of an innocent man than listen to the words and teaching of Jesus with a desire to understand. Say, Pastor, this is helpful and all, but we don't know any Henry's or Sam's or even Phil's today. But like your coworkers who have different personalities and ways of working and doing things, you just might. Henry has heard about Jesus. Perhaps his grandmother went to church, and perhaps took him in as a little boy. He went to Sunday school. Now he has grown up, but he knows better. And seeks Jesus is only uh, for people who are really serious about their faith. Faith that to him is only what is important to someone in that moment. When that hype fades, so does his faith. Then there's Sam. Sam perhaps grew up in church and had, or even had an experience later in his life, a come to Jesus moment. He threw, they threw themselves into God, into the church, and really felt like a part of his people, a part of the church. Then after a while, when the magic left, the dust fades. It seems like God stopped answering their prayers. Instead, Sam becomes critical, skeptical, and turns out, tunes out altogether. Then there's Phil, a very devoted religious person who lives his life and yet gets very defensive when you bring up the topic of Jesus, his nature, his claims. Even though Phil might go to church or be of a different religion and talks about God, the topic of Jesus is very defensive for him. When Jesus makes claims like, I and the Father are one, or I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, John 14, 6. Phil represents people who make Jesus not the center of their life, but someone like Darius, even a distraught disciple may. Darius might not have all the answers to every question, yet he continues to follow continues to follow in the midst of the big crowds and the small crowds, even when it's just them and Jesus in the quieter moments. Someone who talks with Jesus, walks with Jesus. In the aftermath, when the dust settles, all that Jesus has done on the cross, Darius is still a follower of Jesus and reminded of his work on the cross. So we might know people like Henry who make Jesus popular for a moment. We may know people like Sam who seek Jesus for just a high experience. We might even know people like Phil who just, get, just gets drunk, uh, disgruntled when we talk about Jesus. But I hope you know some people like the disciples. Might not be the most popular, might not be there for the most elegant or even the religious zealots, but in the end... They are there because they are with Jesus. You know, perhaps the first triumphal entry of Jesus reminds us of a second triumphal entry. You say, are you talking about the second coming? In a way, yes. Matthew describes this in Matthew 24 when he says this, Then the signs of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven, <clears throat> with power and great glory. He will send out his angels with a loud trumpet and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Oh, we might scratch our heads here in the question, who is the elect? We might be better off asking, 
Who is with Jesus after the dust settles? After everything is said and done, after the crucifixion, after his burial, after his resurrection, and ask ourselves, is our faith like that? When the dust settles. Talked about different people have different personalities in the workplace. At the end of the day, don't try to be someone you're not, but be the person God has made you to be. After this triumphal entry, when the dust settles, what do you think the disciples said or did? What did they remember? What did they say in the end? Perhaps there was a song that came to their mind. Remember the words of that old faithful hymn, when the roll is called up yonder, I will be there. Now I wonder if the disciples would have sang that after the resurrection, after the dust settled. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. Instead, perhaps maybe they sang it like this. When the roll is called up yonder, how did I get here? Oh, wait. It's because of Jesus. When the roll is called up yonder, the second coming, we're easy to point the finger those who just hear and walk away, those who seek but only for the experience, those who critique. But what about those who just follow? When the dust settles and the roll is called up yonder, perhaps we'll ask, how did I get here? Oh, wait. It was Jesus. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, it was a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Jesus sitting on a colt, on a donkey. People shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, there are many people around us today, people who seek what is popular, people who seek an experience, people who reject or critique Jesus. And yet, Lord, are we followers that when the dust settles on the other side, that we will be there? May it be because of Christ and what he's done for us. It's your name that I pray. Amen.